before I came here, the last few days, I started to think about uh, a few things um, that popped into my mind, and it was a little bit provoked by the coronavirus and all the attention we're hearing about the coronavirus and how we handled it. And it seemed to me that it paralleled how we handled the climate crisis, not to do really anything much at all, um, to try to go into denial, to do the minimum possible until it hits us as a monumental crisis that we cannot cope with. That's why we have climate change. That's why we're about to go into a serious pandemic um, with the coronavirus. And so thinking about those two things in relation to size well, I, um, I thought, you know, at the moment when we're looking at the climate crisis, which is clearly upon us, which will involve sea level rise and increasing storm surges of greater intensity, to put a nuclear plant on a beach is some sort of level of insanity, frankly. I mean, this is a building containing lethal radioactive waste that will be underwater I mean, we don't know for sure, but there's a high probability that under climate crisis, it'll be underwater. So that's a level of insanity. Then you look at the coronavirus, which sadly is probably not a one-off, and we're going to be dealing with these sorts of things increasingly. And whilst you can walk away from a wind farm, and the wind turbines will keep spinning, and you can walk away from a solar array, and it'll still collect solar energy, you cannot call your workforce home from a nuclear power plant. It cannot be abandoned. To, so, to go forward and build another one of these kinds of structures that cannot be abandoned by the workforce is also some sort of level of insanity. In this country, even the house sparrow is a bird of conservation concern. We're losing nature. We seem to be doing the best we can to turn our country and our planet into Coruscant, the city planet, the ecumenopolis of Star Wars. And this may not be what we real human beings actually want, but it's what the people we've put in charge seem determined to give us. We're now accustomed to the nibbling away of the wild bits. A tree here, a brambly corner there, a pond around the corner. In fact, just around the corner from where I live, there is a housing development that's been put up recently, and it's called Broad Broadland Meadows in honour of the place that was destroyed to make it. We're beginning to really crank up um, some of the messaging though, because basically over the last 10 years, it's been really drip fed to us what the impact will be, what the details of the development will be. But we're now beginning to get a really clear understanding of what the impact will be. This, those of you who are members of the Trust, hopefully will have read my article in the last magazine, uh, outlining where some of those real concerns are, and as Simon alluded to, um, you know it's 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 pretty shocking what some of the, we think that some of those impacts will be. Destroying one habitat to try and mitigate for another is extremely poor practice. Let the little film speak for itself. Here you can feel really close to nature. It's the home of protected animals, including otters and water voles. It's designated as a site of special scientific interest for its rare invertebrates, such as water beetles and dragonflies. Despite that, here would be a massive causeway supporting a four-lane access road leading to the huge reactor platform Lots of people from the nuclear industry and indeed our own local Member of Parliament, Therese Coffey, refer to nuclear as zero carbon. And it's, uh, it's another myth that's perpetrated by the nuclear industry. If you can say things that are untrue or certainly half true, enough times people will be begin to believe it. I was at a, a, a meeting in, um, where was it now? Um, Bramfield, that's right, uh, during the consultation uh, meetings that EDF were holding and one of the representatives from EDF told one of the people in the audience who asked about nuclear waste, don't worry about nuclear waste, we have a solution for it, it's solved, you don't have to worry about it at all, which is an absolute untruth. It's not solved by any, in any manner of means, but if they say it long enough and hard enough, people will tend to believe it. Even the Environment Agency will tell you 
that disposal of radioactive waste, which is the recommended method of dealing with our huge legacy waste and indeed future waste, is safe and secure. It's not safe and secure because the, the, the Radioactive Waste Management Organisation, part of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, which has the responsibility for finding a repository, has at least a hundred unsolved, unresolved issues about dis uh, disposal of radioactive waste on their books as we speak, and they have shown no indication that satisfies their critics that they are dealing with them in an effective way. So the industry itself is trying to ensure that we all believe that everything's hunky-dory, everything's fine, we've got the solutions to all these problems that are racked up, and that's not true. And the same is true with, with, with low carbon. We can look, you've got to mine the uranium in the first place, you've got to mill it, you've got to convert it to uranium hexafluoride, you've got to enrich it, you have to fabricate the fuel, you have to construct a complicated nuclear reactor and all its facilities. You have to uh, look at the associated blight on the site clearance. You have to look at uh, plant operations for up to 60 years. If they're, they're planning for size, we'll see to operate for 60 years, folks. I don't know if you knew that. Then you've got to look at the back end. <coughs> this is where complete mystery occurs. After you've irradiated the uranium rods in the, in the nuclear reactor, you have to do something with them. They're hot, they're intensely hot intensely radioactive, they have to be stored under water and then taken to dry stores for at least five or six decades, probably a hundred years they're talking about at Sizewell, because the, the fuel that you get at Sizewell is much more hot and much more radioactive than the fuel even from Sizewell B, because of the, of the additional burn-up times. Um, so you, we've got a, you've got to decommission the reactor over tens of decades, you've got to spec fuel storage and conditioning for that period of time, You've got nuclear waste disposal facilities between 200 and 1,000 metres deep if we ever get around to it. We haven't even got a volunteer community yet, so that's many, many years away. You've got to emplace the waste. We've got a, site, a mine site rehabilitation and transport for all those previous phases of the nuclear fuel cycle. You're not telling me that that's carbon free. You're not telling me that that's low carbon even. And indeed, it's been put to the test by Dr. Benjamin. Sir, so, thank you very much. I'll miss the surname off, thanks. And Mike, I think Mike told me about that when he looked at my slide. <laughs> well, it might be Dr. Benjamin, who knows? <laughs> so let's call him Dr. Benjamin. I've signed the Science Policy Research Unit at Sussex, carried out 103 nuclear power life cycle studies, and found the nuclear power plants produce electricity with a mean of 66 grams per kilowatt, uh, excuse me, 60 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour compared to 9.5 to 38 grams for renewables. It's not low carbon and it's not, uh, certainly not carbon free. Bradwell A, which was um, operating from 1962 to 19, 2002, uh, but it's not gone away, it is still there. You have got Sizewell A, that was four years later and therefore finished in 2006, stopped operating. Again, that's left an accumulation of, of legacy waste. And also Sizewell B, which as you know is still operating and which has spent fuel stored um, on the coast here. Those three stations are committed. Where are we? We've now, I want just to say something about climate change. I don't know whether I've got enough time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, friends. And uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the, the, at the moment, the national policy statements are um, talking about these sites. And this refers to Bradwell, but present, uh, broadly speaking, the same thing was said about uh, the size wall. In 2011, that in terms of how you deal with the, the coastal location, uh, in terms of flooding, tsunamis, um, uh, storm surges and so on, they said then it is reasonable to conclude that a nuclear power station could potentially be protected against a flood risk through its lifetime, including the potential effects. I mean, that is very, very uh, equivocal. Uh, even in 2011, and that is the plan which is going forward. I mean, that must be challenged.
uh, when, when you get to your, your planning uh, application. But it's even worse if you turn to the next slide, because they're now trying to review this policy, as I told you. They haven't yet published the review. But this says, to confirm they can protect the site against flood risk throughout its lifetime, and demonstrate they can achieve further measures at the site in future. If you, that is, is even tighter. The constraint, really, that's in the policy is huge. And really, um, it, ought to, it ought to prevail. And, uh, and you've got to hang on to that. The issue of grazing animals and exposure was brought to light in an investigation carried out in 1982, nine years into the operational life of the Vermont nuclear plant, which is now closed. It closed in 2014. And locals first noticed, this is a routine operating plant, no, it's never had an accident. Locals first noticed higher rates of leukemia and cancers in the human population. Then farm animals grazing close to the reactor began to abort. They were giving birth to dead or deformed calves. Cancers amongst cows had been virtually unheard of until then. And soon it was dogs and cats suffering too, prompting a local vet who treated these animals to say there was enough of likely cor correlation with the nuclear plant to warrant an investigation, and there was never an investigation. At Beyond Nuclear, we have spent a number of years contesting a proposed new reactor at the Fermi site in Michigan. We challenged this on a number of fronts, but the one that lasted the longest pertained to the harm that would come to the endangered eastern fox snake. It's a, a constrictor. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources said that building the nuclear plant would, quote, not only kill the endangered eastern fox snake, but destroy its habitat and possibly exterminate the species from the area, unquote. The nuclear company argued that it would create, quote, an, an alternative habitat. I've heard this already today. An alternative habitat for the snake. And of course, our lapdog regulator went ahead and issued the construction license although it's not actually under construction yet. So this notion that species can sort of be picked up and moved around to a place of humans choosing, regardless of the suitability of that habitat or the effect on the indigenous species that are already in that habitat, it comes up over and over again. It's true at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, which is the only, still canceled, but only site that's ever been identified to store of the country's high-level radioactive waste. There, the fragile desert tortoise would be apparently relocated to outside its home range and then do just fine. And the only reason that the contamination of wildlife and nature in Japan isn't infinitely worse is because on the day that those reactors exploded, the wind was blowing out to sea. So it was luck. That's what we're hanging on to here, just luck. And the reason the disaster happened in the first place um, is the same reason it could and possibly will happen here. It was a collusion of government, industry, and regulator. And another reason, of course, that it could happen is human error. That's what happened at Three Mile Island. That's what happened at Chernobyl. You cannot engineer away human error. It's always a possibility. And an additional reason is that but the one that was actually communicated very powerfully. I don't know if you've seen that film, The French Nuclear Trap. I think that yeah. was shown here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was an indictment, really, of both EDF and of the Arriva-designed EPR. It really exposed the truly lamentable safety record of EDF and the, and the design. And in the film, if you remember, building the EPR was even referred to as suicide. Um, the EPR is an unknown, untested design. There are phenomenal flaws that have gone on uh, in the quality control. Um, if you saw the film, you know that they've had transparency problems. They've had um, actually falsification of quality control, uh, both at the Flammenville site in France and the Okoloto site in Finland. Even fundamentals like the concrete pour for the base of the reactor had to be redone. It wasn't done right the first time. The Flammenville containment, this is a key safety part, came from a forge where they had falsified quality control and put in defective parts into who, who knows how many other reactors. The vessel head lid on the EPR in Flammerville is defective, and they're being allowed to install that because it would be so expensive right now to 
to get it out of there, that they're going to go ahead and keep it and then run it for four years and then you have to change it. So they are going to gamble with those people's lives for four years with that defective vessel head. So what happens to Minsmere and the surrounding landscape and its ha inhabitants, both animal and human, if there is a serious accident at Sizewell? So at Three Mile Island, where the true extent of the radioactive releases was suppressed by a judge, so we never really know what got out of there, there are multiple examples, nevertheless, of sudden deaths and strange illnesses amongst animals and people, obviously, as well, but we're talking about animals today. But because of the court order, none of this was adequately studied at the time. But Chernobyl and Fukushima have been studied extensively, especially Chernobyl. Bear in mind that the Fukushima is still relatively recent, so we, it's too soon to assess the long-term damage to, um, and the permanent damage, given the incubation period. Uh, to some of the diseases caused by radiation exposure. But in terms of animals, we've already seen macaque monkeys who um, are abundant in this area and so had been culled uh, routinely. So they already had samples of these monkeys before the Fukushima disaster happened. So we know the before and the after situation. And they found that the macaque monkeys now, their bone marrows are not producing uh, white blood cells. Their young are being born with reduced brain sizes. And they're an important sentinel for us because their DNA differs from ours by only 7%. And these monkeys are suffering in this way because, of course, they could not read evacuation signs. They stayed put in the Fukushima prefecture. And so they're exposed to what are considered low, which is, doesn't mean harmless, low levels of radiation on a routine, ongoing, daily basis. And even with these so-called low levels, we are seeing this kind of serious medical long-term implications. And as I said, we know that it's a result of the radiation exposure, not only because the symptoms match that, but because they've got the samples from before the accident and after, and there's a dramatic change. So when you hear the pro-nuclear pundits dismiss the Fukushima contamination as negligible and low level, remember that even so-called low level is having this drastic effect. And again, you know, please remember low level does not mean harmless. And it's only this way because the wind was blowing out to sea that day. In Chernobyl, you've probably seen stories about how animals are thriving. You know, there's no human beings there, so it's a wildlife sanctuary now, a preserve. But while it may appear that in the absence of humans there are more numbers of animals and that they are doing well, uh, when you actually examine their health, that, that is a very, very different story. And there have been at least 40 different studies that have looked at this. So they have found, for example, that birds around Chernobyl have cataracts, which obviously is fatal for birds if they can't see, they can't hunt and low to zero sperm counts amongst the male birds, and birds and mammals with decreased pregnancy rates, uh, including a species of vole, interestingly enough, and tumors. And the higher the radiation levels, the greater frequency of tumors, and most eerily, there's no decay amongst leaf matter and fallen trees because the microbes responsible for that decay have gone. So time just sort of stands still. <laughs> 